I'd just like to start our meeting and, and welcome everyone to the Saturday talks again. Um, they seem to be very popular and well received and, uh, and it is a wonderful thing that we can keep on with this. So uh, this morning we've got Ron, I don't know, Ron Tonkins, most of you will know him, some of you may not, some of you are new. So Ron's been, uh, is in Southport with Eileen, his partner, and they have a class there, which has been going some years. Um, but Ron's been mainly based in Manchester and he started in uh, a similar year to me, 84 we worked out, 83, 84, so we've been at it since then. And he's been very involved with lots of classes, particularly Sutter groups, which have gone on for a long time and been very popular. He was also very instrumental in creating the catalogue for the new library in Manchester, which um, if any of you have been there, well, you'll know how much was involved in doing that. And it is a, a truly incredible library. And Ron's been the sort of curator or whatever the term is for chief librarian, <laughs> uh, together with others who helped him. So we've got a, an interesting talk today. Um, I know it's about the imperfections and the sutters. So I'm going to pass over to Ron now and um, look forward to your talk, Ron. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, good morning, everybody. <laughs> good morning, Ron. Good morning. Hey, Ron. All right, so I'll, I'll start again. Uh, <laughs> good morning, everybody. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> um, I would like to tell you a story, a story about the imperfections in the practice. And this took place, this particular sutta took place in the, um, the ninth vasa, the ninth range retreat um, after the Buddha's enlightenment. This is actually his, his tenth year of, treat, of, um, of teaching. Um, he's 10 Sasana. Now, the background to the story is it's set in a place called Kosambi. And Kosambi is a large, prosperous town. And um, it's prosperous because lots of travellers travelling up from southern India with goods for sale would stop at Kosambi and rest for a few days and then continue the journey. So there's, um, yeah, they, they, they come with caravans of goods and things like that. So it was, it was a very prosperous place. And it was so prosperous that they actually had four Buddhist monasteries, even so early in the Buddha's teaching period, you know, um, there was a very big one which was called um, Kosingarama, which was funded by a seti. A seti is a banker, and um, a seti called um, Kosinga. And um, this um, This monastery actually lasted for over a thousand years and in the 1950s they did some excavations and dug up some of the foundations and they found that it was like, um, you know, like Nalanda, the, the university, when they excavated there, they found that they built on top of the foundations of previous buildings. So it, <laughs> it must have been quite precarious really but it looked like they'd built buildings on top of foundations and as, as it had expanded and changed over the years. So the monks at Gosingarami decided that they'd invite the Buddha for the range retreat and the Buddha accepted and so they sent an invitation out to all the monasteries around the other, the other three monasteries and invited the monks from those monasteries to come and join in the celebrations and you know to just, just participate meditate with the buddha and so on and they also 
advertised it in, in the town as well. Told all the townspeople this great speaker was coming and he was going to give us lots of Dhamma talks. So, that's the background to the story. So what I'd like to do now is just chant a homage to the Buddha and then we'll begin the sutta. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutassa So, the sort starts in a very traditional way. Thus have I heard. These are the words of Ananda. It chanting in different ways. Sometimes it's thus have I heard, so have I heard, such have I heard, so on. But they are the words of Ananda. As he, as he talked about each of the suttas at the first council, the first council after the Buddha's passing away, after his Parinibbana. I'll tell you the story about how Ananda became the Buddha's attendant. So the Buddha had been teaching for 20 years now and um, he'd had lots of attendants. Some of them stayed for a day, a week, perhaps a month even. But they weren't very consistent, you know, and, and, and I think the Buddha, after 20 years of, of this, decided he wanted something a little bit more permanent. He wanted somebody now who would step forward and volunteer to stay with him for the rest of his, the rest of his life. So he called together all the Arahants and, and a lot of the senior monks and he had a meeting with them and he explained the position that he wanted an attendant, a permanent attendant, till he died. And of course they were all eager, you know, all the Arahants volunteered, you know, and the Buddha one by one gave a reason why not, you know. Some were busy, they were teaching other monks, they were um, involved in the Vinaya, involved in other studies, um, developing the psychic eye and things like that. They were all, they all had something that they were involved in. And then he went and looked at all the monks and it was the same with them. There was always a reason why not, until there was just one monk left. And the Buddha turned to him and he said, Ananda, you've not said anything yet. And Ananda said, I would be very willing to do this job, but I've got some conditions. So the Buddha asked him, what is your condition? And Ananda said, the first one is that I want to eat the same food as all the other monks. I don't want any special food from your bowl. So the Buddha agreed to that. And then he said, I want to wear the same robes as all the monks. I don't want any special roles. And the Buddha agreed to that. And he said, I don't want a special cootie. I don't want extra accommodation or um, facilities. I just want to have a cootie, a hut, accommodation, just like all the other monks. And the Buddha agreed to that. And he said, finally, if I miss a talk, 
If I miss a Dhamma talk that you give, I want you to repeat it to me, word for word, later on. And I'd like you to tell me all the Dhamma talks that you've given before as well, in the previous 20 years. <laughs> and the Buddha agreed to this as well. So this is how we now have um, Ananda, who is the attendant for the Buddha. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because Ananda is a cousin of the Buddha. He's, um, uh, he's the son of the Buddha's father's brother. Um, <laughs> so, and actually, the interesting thing is, they were born on the same day, the full moon in May. Um, so they were both exactly the same age. Anyway, um, that was a slight digression, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> <I'm not laughs> so, um, oh yes, just as I heard, the Buddha arrives at the Singh <laughs> Park, and um, the um, Uh, he, he, he goes off and he has a day's abiding in the woods nearby. And when he comes back, um, sorry, can I, I'll, I'll go back a little bit first because I, I've missed a bit out. It's quite an important bit actually, you'll find out in a moment. Um, <laughs> when um, when the monks joined together, the monks from the other monasteries came and joined, um, it was very quickly discovered that um, some of the monks weren't using the latrine properly. Um, and what was happening is that at Go Singarama, they would leave half a bucket of water in the, latrine, in the latrine so that people could wash themselves. But at the other monastery, they did it the other way around. They would get their own bucket and, you know, take the water that they want and they'd know it was clean and fresh. And then they'd use that for washing themselves. So a dispute arose over this. Monks saying, no, no, we have half a bucket of water. And monks saying, no, no, you take your own water. And it got quite into quite a, an argument, quite a, um, a dispute, lots of wrangling and brawling, and the sort of uses the phrase verbal daggers, which is um, quite descriptive, isn't it? You know, the way you're hurting each other with your own words and that. So anyway, the, the Buddha's now come back from a day's abiding in the woods. And he's approached by a monk. And the monk asks him, Venerable Sir, we've got this dispute. It's disturbing everybody. The town people are very upset. Would you go? Would you call a meeting and get them together and see if you can make some sense out of it? See if you can get them to be um, you know, more friendly towards each other. So, the Buddha then calls a meeting and he gives a talk and he gives a talk about right speech and he, he uses some verses from the Udana or verses that can be found now in the Udana. I'm not sure whether they're in this sort of for the first time or whether he's taken them from the Udana, but anyway. When many voices shout at once, none considers himself a fool, though the Sangha is being split. No, no one thinks it's himself that's at fault. They have forgotten thoughtful speech. They talk, obsessed with words alone. Uncurb their mouths, they bawl at will. None knows 
what leads mTOR to act. And he talks then, he carries on talking about right speech. And one of the monks shouts up and he shouts, wait, wait, venerable sir, let the blessed one, the lord of the Dhamma, live at ease, devoted to pleasant abiding here and now. We are the ones who will be responsible for this quarrelling, drawling, wrangling and dispute. So after that, the Buddha went back to his kuti, and in the morning he rose, put on his, out, his, his inner robes, folded his outer robe up, put it over his shoulder, picked up his dada ball, and went into Kosambi for arms. When he came back, he ate his food, and then he went out into the woods again to have a day of abiding. On his return, he was approached again by a monk who said that nothing has changed. I'd like you to call another meeting and have another word with them. So he does. He calls another meeting and he talks about the perils of hatred. So he talks and he says, these are some verses from the Dhammapada and you probably know them, you've probably heard them before, okay? So, he abused me, he struck me, he defeated me, he robbed me. In those who harbour thoughts like these, hatred, will never be allayed. He abused me, he struck me, he defeated me, he robbed me. In those who harbour no such thoughts, their hatred will be allayed. For in this world, hatred is never allayed by further acts of hate. It is allayed by non-hatred. This is the fixed and ageless law. Those others do not recognize that there are, sorry, that here we should restrain ourselves, but those wise ones who realize this at once end all their enmity. And then again, Somebody stands up and shouts, wait, wait, venerable sir. Let the blessed one, the Lord of the Dhamma, live at ease, devoted to a pleasant abiding here and now. We are the ones who will be responsible for this quarreling, brawling, wrangling and dispute. So the Buddha goes back to his kuti, spends the night, and in the morning he rises, puts on his robe, puts his outer robe over his shoulder, picks up his bowl and goes into Koh Samba for arms food. And then he goes into the woods and eats his arms food in the woods feeling it's a little bit more pleasant there. No. So he has his arms food and then he spends his day in pleasant abiding, meditating. On his return back to Kosambi, to the monastery, he's met again by another monk who says that it's still very unpleasant in here. Um, would you like to try one more time? See if you can get them to agree 
to some kind of normality. So he called a meeting and he gives a talk about companionship. Again, these are probably some verses you may have heard. These again from the, from the Dhammapada. So we've got, if one can find a worthy friend, a virtuous, steadfast companion, then overcome all threats of danger and walk with him content and mindful. But if one finds no worthy friend, no virtuous, steadfast companion, then as a king leaves his conquered realm, walk like a Tusker in the woods alone. <laughs> Better it is to walk alone. There is no companionship with fools. Walk alone and do no evil at ease like a tusker in the woods. A tusker is a very big bull elephant. They don't have any fear, there's nothing to fear, is there? there's nothing bigger than them and uh, they've got big tusks and they stand proud. So that's a tusker. So again we get somebody standing up in the middle of this talk. Wait, wait, venerable sir. Let the blessed one, the Lord of the Dhamma, live at ease, devoted to a pleasant abiding, here and now. We are the ones who will be responsible for this quarrelling, brawling, wrangling and dispute. So the Buddha went back to his cootie. Now, and, um, in the morning he rose, put on his robes, put his outer robe over his left shoulder, picked up his bowl and went into Kosambi for arms food. He came back, sat down in the monastery, had his meal and then he tidied up his living quarters in the area around where he'd been eating. He picked up his ball and he left. It wasn't very comfortable there. There's all this commotion going on. Normally, even with a lot of monks, it's very quiet, very still, and it's possible to live a life of seclusion. But under these conditions, it wasn't. And so the Buddha, as I say, picked up his bowl and he left. And I think word very quickly got around that he'd left and moved on. And the townsfolk started talking amongst themselves in little groups, maybe around a well, just talking, saying, oh, have you heard? You know, the teachers left. We've all been looking forward to all these good talks and that, you know, over the next three months, somebody who knows what they're going to be talking about. And he's gone. And it's these monks, these monks that have sent him away. They're not worthy. They're not worthy of our dharma. So they decided en masse not to feed them until they sorted out their dispute. So the following day, the monks go into Kosambi with their empty bowl. They walk around Kosambi. Nobody comes out. And they have to walk back with their bowls still empty. The monks aren't allowed to knock on doors because that's a bit like begging. But it also um, indicates that they, they, they might be picking particular people because they give nicer food, better morsel. So they're, not, they're just not allowed to knock on doors. And the same thing happened the following day, and the following day, until eventually word got through into the monastery that 
the people of Kosambi had decided to withhold Dana because they weren't worthy, because of all the brawling and wrangling and that that's going on. So this actually concentrated the mind a bit. It actually concentrated the mind a lot. And they sorted out the problem. I mean, what is it? Half a bucket of water. You know, <laughs> arguing about something simple. And a lot of arguments do do that, don't they? They, they? they come from something quite simple, you know, something that niggles somebody and they build it up into quite a, quite a thing. And this, is, um, this is probably the biggest dispute that was in the Sangha in all the time of the Buddha ministry. So they sorted this out. They decided what it was. I, I actually don't know what the answer was, whether it was a half a bookies or no bookies or what, you know. But anyway, it was sorted. And um, the town's people started to give them food again. And then sometime later, they did go to the Buddha when he was at Sawati. And they apologized to him and asked for his forgiveness. And the Buddha gave his forgiveness. Okay. So, we'll follow the Buddha now, we'll go and catch up with him, he's walking through the woods and um, he eventually comes to a village called Bala, Bala Kalona Kakara, quite a mouthful, <laughs> Bala Kalona Kakara, um, translated it means um, um, Town of salt makers. Um, you're okay. So, as he's approaching, um, the venerable Bhagavan sees him coming and he sets out a, a seat and he gets a bowl of water and he goes and he meets the Buddha takes his outer robe off his shoulder, takes his bowl and carries them for him, takes him to his kuti and offers him the bowl of water to wash his feet. This is traditional in India and places, hot places like that, it's just good hospitality. You see he's been travelling in bare feet and so his feet are dirty and it's nice to be able to just sit, wash your feet, feel fresh and also it stops you walking round the cootie with dirty feet. So after he'd washed his feet, Bhagu knelt down, paid his respect and sat to one side. And the Buddha greeted him by saying, I hope you are keeping well, Bhagu. I hope you are comfortable. I hope you are receiving sufficient hours food. This is quite a traditional greeting amongst monks. And because he was the Buddha, he, he wasn't asking how many range of treats he'd done because this is what monks do, they ask each other how many range of trees and then they can work out where their place is in the line. So the people, the monks who've done the most range of trees go to the front and the monks who've done the least end up at the back and all the middling bits sort themselves out. Um, and that actually this happens all the time, doesn't it? Even now, I went to see um, Rowetta Dhamma in um, Birmingham, and even though he was the abbot and he's a very eminent teacher, he's written he's written many books on uh, Abhidhamma and Buddhism and that. Um, there was two monks in line in front of him, 
because they'd actually been in the Dharma, they'd actually been ordained before him. So they come before him. So, so then, um, oh, sorry, yes, Bhagu answers and says, yes, I am well. I am, I am comfortable and I am receiving sufficient arms for me. And so the Buddha instructs Bhagu. We come to one of those stock phrases now that appears in lots and lots of suttas. Okay. He's, he's, he instructs, he inspires, he motivates, and he fills with joy. And this is, this is a beautiful thing, a beautiful thing for a teacher to be able to do is to explain the Dharma, to teach the Dharma, and for the listeners to be inspired by what he's talking about. And because of that, um, it's like that the Dharma is being shown, isn't it? Um, it dispels delusion. And then the, the listener is inspired. He's filled with enthusiasm. He becomes heedless. Okay. And because of this, he's motivated to practice. Okay. He's fired with commitment and motivation. And then he's filled with joy as he practices. The practice, the fruition from the practice, the development that takes place because of this good instruction. So this occurs quite a lot. Instruction, inspiration, motivation, and joy. It comes up a lot in the suttas. And also they sat in the afternoon and they discussed the benefits of solitude. They talked all through the night, they practiced, and in the morning they straightened their robe, put the outer robe over their left shoulder, picked up the round ball, and went into the village for arms. It's only a small village, so they just walked through down the centre lane, and people came out, offered them food. And when they got to the end of the lane, they parted company. Bhagu, uh, so the, the, the Buddha went off into the woods and found a comfortable place to sit. A beautiful place where he could sit and eat his food. Bhagu, however, went back to his kuti and had his meal. And some time later, he was feeling a bit. Um, a bit tired. We're talking about a few months later now, we're not talking about a day or two after. He was feeling a bit tired, a bit restless, so he decided to get up and go out onto his veranda and take some deep breaths, do some stretching exercises and waken himself up. But he steps onto the veranda and he slips and falls. He falls quite heavily. And he thinks, he thinks about this and he, it, it, it sort of reminds him that life um, is very limited and you don't know, you don't know when, when it's going to end. And this inspired him, it encouraged him to get on with the practice. So he went back into his kuti, he sat down. And very soon afterwards, he became an arahant. And then some time later, the Buddha came to see him, to congratulate him. Congratulations. And um, after he congratulated him, they sat for a while discussing Dharma and talking about the benefits of solitude. 
this all seems to be linked, doesn't it, back to the, the story of the, the commotion, the wrangling and the brawling and all that. This, this idea of being able to sit in solitude, to be able to practice and let the practice go deeper and deeper. Meanwhile, the Buddha has finished his meal now and he's picked up his empty bowl and he's set off on his journey again. Okay, so now he's, he's approaching the Eastern Bamboo Park. It's very interesting, this um, Buddha Gosa talks about the, um, the naming, you know, why was it called the Eastern Bamboo Park? And Buddha Gosa says, well, it was because it was to the east of Sarvati. Um, and because it was to the east of Sarvati, um, that's why it was its name, because that's where the Buddha lived most of the time. And there was green bamboos growing there. So it became the Eastern Bamboo Park. So that's how we know it's that. Um, so. As he approaches the park, the park keeper or gardener sees him coming and shouts and stops him. Stop, friend, stop. There are three mendicants in the park working towards their own good. Working towards enlightenment, basically. Um, one of the mendicants Anaruda hears the park keeper, sees what's going on and shouts to the park keeper, let this man in, he's our teacher, please let him in. And he goes to the other two mendicants and gets them together and they, they set some water out and a seat and then they rush off and go and meet the Buddha. Okay, so they meet him and one of them takes his outer robe and one of them takes his bowl and they escort him back to the meeting place where he washed his feet and again um, sorry I must tell you who they are isn't I really I, you know, you can't go along without doing that can we? <laughs> Um, so we have the Venerable Anuruddha, we have the Venerable Nandia, and we have the Venerable Kim, Kimbila. Now, Anuruddha and Nandia, and actually going back to Baku as well, they're all cousins of the Buddha again. Um, and again, they're the sons of the Buddha's father. Uh, sorry, no, no, the Buddha's father's brother. So they're the sons of the Buddha's father's brother. Different wives, mine, but still stepbrothers. Um, how a lot of this came about was that in the second year of his ministry, he went back home, capital of Atsu. And he went to see his, his wife, his son, and his father, and all his friends. And he met people that he'd lived with all his life. And they were all sort of quite taken up with, um, with you know, his appearance, his, his um, tranquility. And they decided, a lot of them decided, um, that they would join the Sangha and become ordained and this is why there is quite a lot of his family or you know his, his larger family in the Sangha. Nambia was actually a, a childhood friend um, so they all knew each other they were all friendly with each other. Okay so then after he's washed his feet um, he turns to Anuruddha and he says, Anuruddha, are you well? 
Are you comfortable? Are you receiving good? Um, Dharma. And Anuruddha says, yes, I am comfortable. I am well, and I am receiving Dharma. Mm. Um, and then um, Nambia and Kimbala do the same. They have exactly the same answer. There's an idiom in Buddhism, in, in the Pali, where it's the leader that's addressed. So in this case, the leader is um, Anuruddha. So the speaker would address Anuruddha. But it, it also includes the other two. But from the Sutta, we get three answers. And the three answers are the same. So from now on, I'm not going to repeat them all. All right, so we'll only get Anuruddha's answer, but it's actually the same answer for the other two monks as well. It's not that they're being pushed out, they are included. All right. <laughs> so then, still bearing in mind what's going on at Kosambe, you know, with all the disputing, the wrangling, and the brawling, and all that that's going on there, <clears throat> the Buddha says, <clears throat> I hope that you are all living in concord, with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. That's lovely that, isn't it? Blending like milk and water. You know, if you've got a glass of water and you pour some milk in it, it just spreads, doesn't it? You don't have to... You don't have to stir it. The milk just spreads throughout the water just like that. that that's, that's that phrase, isn't it? Blending like milk and water with kindly eyes. Yeah. So Anuruddha answers, surely venerable sir, we are living in concord with mutual appreciation without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. But Anuruddha, how do you live thus? So now we get a description from Anuruddha as to how they live in Concord. Venerable sir, as to that, I think thus. It is a gain for me. It is a great gain for me that I am living with such companions in the holy life. I maintain bodily acts of loving kindness toward them. I openly and privately. I maintain verbal acts of loving kindness toward them, both openly and privately. I maintain mental acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately. I consider, why should I not set aside what I want to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do? Then, I set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do. We are different in body venerable sir but one in mind that is how venerable sir we are living in concord with each other with mutual appreciation without disputing blending like milk and water viewing each other with kindly eyes there's another lovely phrase isn't there in there we are different in body but one in mind and this is a phrase that cropped up now and again, and it's always attributed to Anuruddha. Very nice. So the Buddha then replies, good, good Anuruddha. I hope that you, are, you all abide diligently, ardent and resolute. Surely, Venerable Sir, we abide ardent, diligent. And resolute. But Anuruddha, 
how do you abide this? And then Anuruddha talks about um, talks about when they go out on arm drawn, when the first one to come back. Sets the kitchen up, sets chairs to sit down, sit on, sorry, seats to sit on. <laughs> I don't think they have chairs those days, I'm not sure. Um, so he sets out, they set out seats to sit on. And he brings water for washing and drinking, a refuge bucket, and then he can eat his food. And then the second one comes and eats, and the third one comes. And when the third one's finished, they tidy up the eating area, put away the seats, put away the water and the buckets, sweeps up, tidies up. And if they want any help, if they want to do anything, like move a heavy pot that may, may need two of them, then they signal each other with the waving of the hand and they'll come together, move the pot and then depart without speaking. And then every five days they get together and they discuss the Dhamma. They sit up all night practicing discussing Dhamma. And that is how they live. That is how we live. All right. So that is how they abide, isn't it? Diligent, ardent, and resolute. So now the Buddha moves on and he, he starts to talk about their practice. It's almost like going to a report session with a Samatha teacher. <laughs> All right, so, um, again, we are good, good, Anuruddha. But while you abide, thus diligent, ardent, resolute, have you attained any superhuman state? A distinction in knowledge and vision, worthy of the noble ones. A distinction, a, a, sorry, a, a, a comfortable abiding. So then he goes on to say, and Anuruddha says that um, they do, they say sit and they get visions of light. Um, I'm going to make a slight alteration to the, to the sutta at this point um, because he, he includes forms as well. So he, he says we get, you know, we get visions of light and we get visions of form. The visions of light are referring to the nimitta arising. The visions of form are referring to the psychic, the dharma eye opening. Um, so I've actually put that down on one side because it creates quite a lot of complication a bit later on in the footer. So it, it, it's simpler to just look at the one aspect of what happens when the nimitta appears. All right, it makes it so much easier. And we're going to talk about the hindrances now. And these aren't the hindrances that you would teach to a beginner. You know, the first one in this case is doubt. And to a beginner, you would talk about doubting the practice, doubting the teacher, doubting their ability. But now we, we've got beyond that stage. You know, we, we're not, we, 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 we've seen the nimitta. So we know the practice work. We don't have that kind of doubt anymore. So I'll carry on with the sutta. Uh, but just, just to bear that in mind, if, if you want to know how it works out with the Dhamma Rai as well, then um, you would have to read the sutta. Now, 
right? Now, there's, there's a long phrase that the Buddha uses, and because there are 11 items in this list, I'm only going to read the phrase once, and then after that, I'm just going to list the items because there's only one word difference. Um, we'll be here tonight if I read them all out every time for every item. All right. So, so Anuruddha has just said that the, the, the vision of light has appeared and it's after a while it disappears. All right. So then the Buddha say to him, you should discover the cause of that, Anuruddha. Before my enlightenment, while I was still an unenlightened bodhisattva, I too perceived the light. Soon afterwards, the light disappeared. I thought, what is the cause and condition why the light has disappeared? Then I considered thus, doubt arose in me, and because of the doubt, my concentration fell away. When my concentration fell away, the light disappeared. I shall so act that doubt will not arise in me again. So in this case, the doubt is the doubt that we, we all see, isn't it? We get it from 90% of the people who report to us. Uh, oh no, that wasn't an imiter. No, no, it wasn't like that. Uh, it didn't feel like this. Or it didn't feel like that. Or you know, um, I'm expecting a great big firework display, and um, or something like that. You know, and and uh, it, it, it's but the is not like that, is it? The imiter is something quite plain. You know, and that they're expecting some kind of Buddhist tan tanker, you know, like the Tibetan painting or something like that, uh, an image of the Buddha perhaps. But the Nimitta comes from the breath. And it's that transformation, isn't it, from the breathing to the image. And the mind has to find something, something that represents the breath. So it's going to be it's searching around in itself to find something. And it finds something quite simple. In the Vasudhimagga, they talk about um, the moon coming from behind the trees or behind the clouds, coming from behind the clouds. They talk about um, a disk of light like the sun or even something very flimsy like the smoke coming off an incense stick. You know, so the, the images that they're giving are very simple. If it's complicated, it's difficult. It's hard to maintain it. So make it as simple as you can. Okay, that's doubt. The second one is inattention. Inattention. You know what that is, don't you? You know, we want to be somewhere else, don't we? we, we oh, this image, it's, I'm fed up with it now. Um, or you might be wanting to just, something comes up. You hear a sound and the connection's made. And you start thinking about, oh, somebody blew in up or something like that. All that kind of stuff comes up, doesn't it? So that's the second one. Inattention. And the third one we all know, don't we? It's sloth and torpor. And in this case, what we need to do actually is to make the nimitta brighter. Put a little bit more energy into the practice. Just sit up a little bit more upright and put that extra effort into the practice. Visualize the light getting brighter, make it brighter. You don't want to go to sleep. You just blank out, don't you? In the description of uh, Slot and Torpa in the Digger Nikaya, 
the Buddha talked about it's like being in prison. <clears throat> There's a fair going on outside the prison, but you can't be a part of it because you're in sleep. And it's like the practice is going on out there. And because you're asleep, you're not a part of it. You're missing all that practice time. So that's what I'm talking We all work with that, don't we? We all, at some time or another, you know, we start to slump on the cushion, don't we? So the next one, the fourth one, is fear. Now, the Buddha gives a description with some of these. And this is one that he does give a description for. And he talks about going on a journey. Remember, in those days, going on a journey means walking somewhere. So you're walking in the countryside, and from behind some trees come some murderers with daggers, and they're intent on killing you. And we're talking about that kind of fear. That's quite strong, isn't it? But people do have a strong fear, don't they? They they have this they get to a certain point in the practice and they've got to go through a doorway, they've got to go through a threshold. There's there's something there and, and it, it's going out into the unknown. Pushing pushing practice. Okay, so what we have to do is to do it gradually, don't we? A little at a time. Each time we come back to that point, just edge towards it, just a little bit, a little bit, until eventually we have enough courage to step forward and go through. I think we all, we've all experienced that where, you know, we've had something it's almost like the feeling that you're going to walk through it off the edge of a cliff and fall for hours, you know. Um, I think the romantics have a lot to do with some of the things that we think about when we, you know, when we get to that stage in the practice. So the fifth one is elation, elation. Um, and the Buddha's description of this one is a man who's searching for treasure. He knows that there's some treasure and he finds an opening. And he's, like he's looking for an opening into a cave where there's a lot of buried treasure. And it's as though he comes across five openings with five lots of treasure. And it's the joy. It's the joy that he feels. And this joy is the joy of the progress of the practice. You know, we've all done it, haven't we? We've got to a point and we've gone, wow, you know, brilliant, you know, oh, I really enjoyed that. And you're back at the beginning, aren't you? You know, you've lost it all. The limit is gone, everything's gone. And again, this is one of those that, you have to approach it gently. You know, it, it's like it's like taking a child to the bath and introducing them to the water. You know, you, you let them get the feet wet first and you let them just splash about a little bit with the feet and then you coax them in a bit further so that it comes up to their ankles and then a bit further so eventually it comes up to the knees and, and so on. And, you know, you may have to go to the bath a few times to do this, but you know, you, you just have to introduce it very slowly. And it's the same when you get to this stage in the practice. You know, we, we just have to take it as far as we can and then come back a little bit. And then next time do the same, take it a bit further if we can, then come back. Easy to learn, gradually get to know it. Now then, <clears throat> the sixth one is inertia. Inertia. And this is bodily inertia. This is 
you know how you feel after you've had a, a good meal? You feel ever. And you feel, mm, it's difficult to do a practice, isn't it, when you feel like that? It's almost like the heaviness of the body makes the mind feel heavy and sluggish and tired and it's difficult to work with it. And that's what this inertia is. So I suppose really the answer is not to eat quite so much. You know, just think about the practice first and eat, eat just sufficient, sufficient for your own well-being. The next two are very interesting, but they're, they're, they're a pair, really. One is excessive energy, and one is um, deficiency of energy. So I'll take them as a pair because it is, you know. The Buddha describes the excess of energy being like a person who holds a quail, a small bird in his hands and it holds it too tight and kills it. Whereas the opposite, the deficiency of energy, is where you hold the bird very, very loosely in the hands. And, you know, the bird just flies away. And it's the same with the practice. The practice just falls away and you've lost it. You're back at the beginning again. Um, there's an interesting story, isn't there, about a man playing a lute, singing. He sings about the strings. He sings about the strings being too tight. Excuse me. The liable to snap. If the strings are too slack, the sound is very, very well. There isn't really, is there? So there has to be something in the middle a middle way where the strings are just right and you can play a tune and that's what we need to do with the energy we need to balance it and we need to get it so it's just right okay So, the ninth one is longing, craving, tanha. What we need to do in the case of this is to create a feeling, to develop a feeling of, of contentment. Okay? Saying, this is enough for me. I'm quite content with this. I don't need any more. And in some ways, this is almost like a, a letting go, isn't it? And the practice only progresses when you let go. The more you can let go of it, the more it will progress. It's very difficult, isn't it? You know. Um, the story about a glass of water. You know, you're holding the glass of water and it doesn't matter how much you try to relax. You can't actually stop it from shaking. You can't actually stop it from making ripples. The only way to stop it from making ripples is to put it down. Let go of it. Just like in the practice. Let go. <clears throat> now. Now then, we come to number 10, which is perception of diversity. I talked about the image at the beginning, and now we want, you know, we, we, this is where we really need the image to be very simple. You know, because it's actually the complicated image that causes this diversity. And if you have got a complex image, find a part that's the brightest. 
and go to that. Just pick a particular spot, go to that, and just hold your attention on that spot. Okay. Zoom in. Just hold that right area. It's a bit like watching a program on the television, isn't it? You see the television picture, but you don't see the television set. So, you know, just, just zoom in like that. So, the final one, the eleventh one, is um, excessive meditation upon thorns. This is a bit of a long-winded, old-fashioned way of putting it, but it's basically talking about uh, reflecting and pondering. You know the way we do in the practice sometimes, an, an idea, a thought. Maybe we think it's some kind of wisdom that's come up in the practice. And we decide to indulge in it. We think about it, we talk about it, we, we, we ruminate on it. You know, but the practice isn't going anywhere. You know, and what you need to do when something like that happens, is to just say to yourself, I'll deal with it in the recollection and then move on. Just let it go. Don't hang on to it any longer. So that is the 11 obstructions to the practice. It's interesting actually because when I um, when I read a sutta, I usually find that after after about two or three pages, I want to stop reading and I want to do a practice. There's something about reading sutras to me that just makes me want to sit and do a practice. So I'm going to do a practice. And if you wish, you can join me. Um, I'll let you know where I'm at and where I'm going. I'm going to do the longest of counting, the longest of following, longest of touching, longest of settling. And I'm going to go through fairly briskly so that we have a little bit longer in the settling. And then I'll tell you when I'm going to come out again. And then if you wish, you can change, you can do your own practice. But by me telling you where I'm doing, where I am and what I'm doing, uh, you'll have an idea of how long you've got. All right. Return to normal breathing. I'll do recollection practice. And when you're ready, open your eyes and this will finish the practice. Thanks, Ron. Right. Um, there is a bit more, um, but I'm wondering about the time as well, actually. Um, Was it a bit? It's now 20 to 12, and we usually right. finish around 12. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Depends what, what kind of bit more. <laughs> well, it's a little interesting tale to the end of the story, you know. <laughs> Um, Can you do it in five minutes? <laughs> I'll do my best, all right. <laughs> I'll, I'll speak in super speed. Whatever uh, you feel is right, it's just... Um, 
we could go on forever actually it would be very nice go ahead ron go all right. all right. so um they carried on they, they carried on discussing the dhamma and they talked about the benefits of living in concord and then the following morning they went into the local village for arms and after they'd eaten the buddha left and he went deeper and deeper and deeper into the forest until he came to a clearing and in the clearing at one side there was the auspicious sal tree and beyond the trees there was a lake a lake for bathing and washing and drinking and you know lots of uh, animals used and so it looked like a nice place for the buddha to stay and he sat and he did a practice and towards the evening, he came to the end of his practice. He opened his eyes and sat in front of him was a big bull elephant, just meditating like he was. And next to the bull elephant was a little monkey, again meditating. They picked up on something, hadn't they? They picked up on, on the Buddha's metta and they'd come to join him. And these two animals looked after him. They fed him and watered him and uh, made sure he had plenty of nice soft grass to sit on. The monkey had some honeycomb which he gave to the Buddha as well. And at the end of the three months retreat, um, he, um, he had to leave and go back to his ministry. The monkey actually had, had fallen from the tree and he, he'd actually died by falling onto a stump. But the elephant unfortunately died of a broken heart. He got so attached to being with the Buddha and enjoying that solitude that was there. And so both of them died, but they went to, um, is it um, Tabatimsa, the Tabatimsa heaven. So they made good progress in their practice, didn't they? There's a lot more detail I could have put in, but <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had to paraphrase it a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, wonderful how you... The stories keep flowing out from one into the other, don't they, Ron? They, they, they do, yes. I mean, there's probably about six different sources involved in that talk. Wow. Uh, all, all blended together, you know. Um, very interesting. But I've, I've really enjoyed doing it, actually. Right. Great, yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful to get back to the source, isn't it? You know, um, to, to, to take you right back to the origin and, um, yeah. you know, uh, be sort of directly connected in that way and feel as though you're with it at the time and because um, you know it all so well and all the detail it, it, it's just a, a wonderful experience going back there and all that wisdom so <laughs> yes. and i'm just going to keep an eye out if you if you raise your hand and if more than one people raise their hand i'll say the name and then you you unmute yourself so i'm looking around now on the screen would anyone like to offer a comment or a question to ron while we've got the chance I can see Roberta, so will you unmute, Roberta? Um, yes, I'd just like to ask Ron, um, the list of, of the 11, which sutta does that come from? Uh, it's the Majjhima Nikaya, yeah. 128. And Thank it's you. called the Upakalesa. Say that again. Upakalesa. Upakalesa. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Is there any other? I'm looking for. There's Sarah. Will you unmute Sarah? Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I just wanted to say um, thank you, Ron. Um, <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs> I kind of felt like we've been taken back to, to ancient India and there was like a real <laughs> flavour. It, it brought, brought the, the Buddha to life yeah. for me, anyway. And as you were going through the list of the imperfections, I was mentally going, check. Check. <laughs> <laughs> so that was <laughs> very, very helpful. Thank you. They're quite familiar, aren't they? They're quite familiar, some of them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The stories actually come from virtually all the sections of the of the um, the Pali Canon, the Tipitaka. Um, you know, we've got some stuff from the Vinaya, some from the Diganikaya. A lot of it comes from the Majjhima in different ways, and then there's a little bit from the Samyutta Nikaya, and then we've got the um, the Dhammapada, the Udana. Uh, that's where the story of the elephant is. Um, the Sutanipata. Uh, and then there's the Daragatha. <laughs> uh, that's where we've got some of the stories about, you know, Baku and his enlightenment and that. Um, and a little bit from King Melinda. And I think a lot of stuff is. Um, I have no idea where it comes from. You know, it, it's stuff that I've picked up over the years as I've practiced and had discussions with other people and been in groups and things. So, it's been a really, really interesting um, experience doing this talk. Yeah, and I've, been, I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> Where's Joe? Is Joe there? Okay, Joe, unmute. Go for it. Um, Ron, thank you. It seemed really uh, relevant to me that you were talking. Oh. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ron. It seemed really relevant to me talking about Concord in the home. So that was very helpful. <laughs> yeah so that was very 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 good and um i wanted to know i i wanted to thank you for um the instruction the inspiration the motivation and joy that you have provided today oh, and, and and could you tell me the numbers from the dharmapada oh gosh the numbers from the dharmapada um the uh, the, the, the the early ones are, um Three, four, five, and six. Okay. Um, the very first two about right speech are from the Udana. Um, and then, um, so I think about the, um, they, they, they come much later on in the, um, the Dhammapada. Um, you know the ones about friendship, about um, companionship. Um, what is that? Three hundred and uh, three hundred and twenty-eight to three hundred and thirty. Thank you. That, the, the, yeah, that's that's the one on good friends, worthy friends, and that. Um, That Colleen, did you put your hand up then, Colleen? No, okay. No, sorry, but I was thinking, I'm not, I'm not familiar with any of the sutras, so have you got any advice for jumping in? It's quite daunting. <laughs> <laughs> um, a good one to start with is the Majjhima Nikaya, because it does talk a lot about um, 
about practice and the teachings a bit more uh, and it's a bit more sort of inclusive in each sutta there's, there's a bit more variety you know what I mean a lot of the like the samyasas and that they actually concentrate on a particular thing um, a particular aspect of perhaps a list or even just a short part of the list the angle to the talks about the full list basically um, but the Majjhima Nikaya is interesting it, it does talk a lot about the Buddha's life and the different things he does and where he is and it, it had, adds some interest to it doesn't it it adds a bit of background information um, Oh, so, does, yeah. it, does it mean middle length sayings? Does middle length sayings, yes. You know, because there's lots of volumes of teachings and and that, you know, that means there's the longer saying, shorter sayings, and the majima means the middle length saying. So it's a volume. But like you, a lot of the that looks very scholarly and erudite, but it's full of stories. Each chapter is a story with characters and places. And um, I, I don't know whether they may exist, but I, I've often thought it would be if there was a children's version of it, you know, because yeah. or an illustrated one yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or a simplified version. It would be really good as an introduction for, for people to propagate it, because as it stands, yeah. all I know is the Jataka tales are in story form and they're yeah. for children. Yeah. But the suttas, it was suggested to me once by a publisher that it would be good to have such a thing, but uh, yeah. it, it might exist in India or somewhere. But uh, anyway, I think, you know, Colleen, you can read the, you know, the middle length sayings, a big volume, but you can pick one chapter out and mm. just read it and it's quite readable though it doesn't look it yeah the sight <laughs> yeah. um, um, well, the wisdom version translation is a good one isn't it you know with Bikku Bodhi and Jan Mole yeah and they give a little yeah. introduction and tell it, it, yeah there's a very good introduction in that isn't there mm. um, I wondered Ron how do you remember it mm. <laughs> There's so much detail. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a, lot, a lot of it is, a lot of it is just um, uh, know, a lot of stock phrases as well, you know. Um, that's why the repetition works because you do have to repeat the same. <laughs> it holds it in the mind, doesn't it? So yeah. do you remember it all? Yeah, um, yeah most of it. Yeah, yeah. most of it. I, I, I have read some bits of it, but not a lot. Wow. Well, it, but it is, it's nice. It's nice to just, I, I find that I can remember things in story form. Mm. But if, if I just had the bare list, I wouldn't be able to remember it. You know, I, I find that difficult. Mm. You know? So I, I, I've actually had a list of the, um, the 10 imperfections on the computer that I could yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, just as, as a name, you know. Oh, yeah. I can remember what's about them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then when I finish now, I'll remember lots of things I did want to say, but I've forgotten to say. <laughs> <laughs> it was very rich, Ron. It was very rich. So many. <laughs> I know. It, many, yeah. yeah. So was it actually a collection? It was mainly based on one sutta, wasn't it? But then you incorporated some other teachings related yeah. to it from the Dhammapada. It, it, it was just these, these things actually happened in the same period, you see. It, it all happened in the range retreat yeah in the ninth range retreat yeah um and a lot of people that they, they don't really realize that it, it doesn't say that in the sutta mm -hmm. you know it, it, it's stuff that you have to you have to be a really good detective yeah, yeah. you know yeah. there are places there are books there's a, a beautiful book um called the dictionary of Pali proper names <laughs> now in the library in manchester we have a copy of this book and it takes 12 inches on the shelf there's only two, they're massive, you know, they're really heavy. But you can get it online on a website called Pali Canon. It's a German one, so Canon is spelt with a K. And they have an English section and they have it online, so it, it's actually digitized. 
Um, it's so much easier to use than getting the books out. Um, and then there's also another book, which probably a lot of you know about, is the, um, the Buddhist book of, um, oh, the Dictionary of um, Buddhist Terms by Nyanati Loka. That's a very good one. If you want to know a bit of the theory, you know, um, you know, it, it talks about the Sudi and all the different lists and that that are in the sutras. Um, you know, the Noble Eightfold Path. It explains it, and then it gives details about what each of the just steps on the path are, and so on. But it covers a lot of the doctrine uh, in a very simple, simple form in a readable form. Very good. They're the two books I work with quite a lot in terms of trying to work out the sort of... All right, so that's good starting for the Dictionary of Buddhist Terms and the Dictionary of Pali Proper Names yes. was the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you look at the hindrances perhaps in that one, the Dictionary Sorry? of Terms, if one looked up hindrances, for example, yeah, yeah, it, it talks about all the hindrances. And it, actually, the, the two books give you a lot of references to where you would find it in the Pali Canon itself. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's very good reference books. That's definitely investigation of Dhamma, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Pali Canon with a K. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking around if there's any to see if anyone's putting their hand up or wanting to say anything. Mm. It's coming to our end, I think, now. In terms I, I think of so. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't actually see anyone now. Oh, yeah. Diana's waving. Diana, oh, right. so unmute Diana, please. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank, thank you, Ron. That was lovely. You're welcome. Um, and yeah, also I was thinking how nice it is, you know, to have these stories read. Like last last week, we had Rob Adkins reading a story. And mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yeah. Really nice, yeah. Um, very enjoyable. And apparently, the suttas are much closer to the actual teachings of the Buddha than, say, the Abhidharma, which was compiled mm -hmm. much later. The mm -hmm. suttas are more kind of authentic. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, very good yeah. place to go, really. But thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you, yeah, Diana. yeah, it is. But those of us who have yeah. been to India, like you have, some of those places are real historical places. Yes, yeah, they it are. Makes it makes it seem historically yeah. real. They're not just stories that it was like things that really happened. And and because we're here in the UK in this situation, you know, sometimes that seems like a mythical play realm but in fact the stories like Diana said are of real people real places and very close to the the original teaching mm -hmm. um, and that that fear of delving into something very scholarly like Colleen mentioned you know you think well I can't get into that but you know once you overcome that hurdle like you've yeah. just suggested yeah. it uh, opens up a whole world doesn't it yeah, yeah. I think it's like learning to chant, isn't it? You, you know, the first chant you learn is always the hardest one. Uh, but then you start to get your, your mouth and your tongue around the phrases and the different ways of pronouncing things. And, and the next sort of becomes easier. The next, the next bit of chanting that you learn becomes easier. And it's a bit like that with the sutras. Once you get the hang of how they work uh, and, and what's going on. There's, there's quite a lot of, as I keep saying, stock phrases. And, um, you know, you, you can plug through them a bit quicker then. Mm. Well, that's it. We get more. You'll have to come back for a second talk, actually. I'll already book you for the next <laughs> lot because um, there's such a, a, an endless supply there, Ron. <laughs> I don't know. About <laughs> there is. You can be back. So, um, I seem to be forgetting it as quick as I'm learning it, you know. <laughs> so, are we going to finish in it in any way, or just? Um, I'd, I'd like to. I'd like, I would like to chant the blessing. Yeah. But I would also like somebody to chant the first verse of the Bojangas. Oh somebody would volunteer to do that for me. Hmm? 
I can't. I haven't looked on the screen for a volunteer. Yet. It's always hard to find a volunteer <laughs> by Zoom. Uh, I'll do it, if Veronica. If okay, Eileen. I haven't. Uh, uh, yes, Eileen. You you do it. You probably. I was going to, but I'm not that confident with it. So, Eileen. Um, page 30 if anyone's looking in the book right. so just the first verse the first verse yes please go jango sati sankato dhamma language ayo tata william piti pasadi Bajanga chatata pare samadu peka bojanga sate te sabata sina munina samada kata bawita bahuli kata Sangwat tante aben ya ya ne bana ya chabodia ete na sa chawaje na sa ti te ho tu sa bada. Sadhu. 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 Just to say to everyone, next week, uh, Richard Teal is going to...